Lift our hands and usher in the presence of the Lord in this service tonight. God, we love you, Lord. We praise and magnify your great name, Jesus. Oh, Lord, we lift you up, Lord. We magnify you, God. You are great. You are holy. You're righteous, Jesus. Oh, God, we love you, Jesus. Amen. From the mighty works that you have done, praise God. Glory, glory.
Jesus. (laughs) Hallelujah. I'll never forget, Lord. My God, thank you, Lord. Amen. Paul reminded the church in Ephesus to remember that in times past we were Gentiles without any hope. We were outside of the commonwealth of Israel. We weren't part of the promises that were extended to the circumcision. But Christ in his love broke down that middle partition. Oh, God, when he said it is done, the veil ripped from top to bottom. Thank God that he had in mind you and I when he was on the cross. We were a people without a God. Amen. And God saw fit through his love to include a Gentile bride. Amen. So appreciative. I'll never forget what he's done for me. Never. Amen. The devil's been telling lies, but I know the truth. The devil's been telling lies, but I know the truth. The devil's been telling lies, but I know the truth. I've been delivered. Satan's under my feet. I've been forgiven. So you ain't got nothing on me. I've been delivered. Satan's under my feet.
under my feet. We're blessed this morning by the ministry of Brother and Sister Showstrand. And I, I mentioned today that maybe we could get Brother and Sister Elms to come and give a word of testimony or edify whatever they feel in their heart. And I would like for them to come if they would. Um, many of you, you may be seated. We, we give high honor regularly around here. This church is here because of a man with the last name of Elms. Amen. Pastor Royce Elms pastored here. Uh, for 40 years, and the Lord took him, but um, his legacy and Mark is remaining here. And it's a great honor to have his younger brother with us tonight at Jubilee Apostolic Church. And uh, Brother David Elms is a pastor in North Carolina where he's had a great and powerful ministry. He's been district superintendent there and led so very many ways. And his sister Elms is one of the most fiery ladies of God I've ever known every time she comes to Jubilee just give her a word of testimony and the house is going to go up because there's a fire shut up in her bones and I thank God for people like this who love the Lord and serve the Lord so beautifully and I want them to come and share a word of testimony tonight we love you would you make the Elms feel welcome right here at Jubilee today praise the Lord we sit here tonight as a very privileged people. There's millions of people out there that's never felt what we felt in the first few minutes of this service tonight. I thank God. You know, I thought, there's a lot of things that I've done, and they were good. And I walked away, and I forgot them. But I can truly say, I've not forgot when I've walked into an apostolic church. There's something about the Holy Ghost. There's something about the power of God. When his people starts worshiping him, he will come. He will come. I said he will come. And you can feel him tonight. You can feel his power. I could feel his smiles. I could feel his thanksgiving for all the praises of his people. And if there's anybody in Amarillo tonight that God is noticing, it's in this congregation. God doesn't waste time. He doesn't call a people and leave them alone. But he calls a people. And when that people respond to him, he responds to them. And we have felt him, I have felt him walk in this building tonight. And with your prayers and with your praises, it has magnified. And I have felt his holiness. And you have too. There's a great joy in the power of the Holy Ghost. You know, I love serving God. When I was a child, I went to a United Pentecostal church, or maybe it was called Apostolic Church back then. It's been so many years. But they had the same thing. Their name was just different. But they were UP, United <laughs> Apostolic Pentecostal people, baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost. And when you get among those people, if you've never seen them before, they feel like family. That's the way I feel here tonight. A lot of you don't know me, and I don't know your names, but I know you because I feel your spirit. And there's nothing like serving God. 
You know, even if we have to go through persecution, we don't know what's ahead of us. We know that's exactly what the enemy would like to do. But God is going to stand right next to us. He is going to be our, he's going to be standing there. This is, I don't know why I'm saying this tonight, but with so many things going on in the world today, so many troubles, so many things and disappointments going on, we don't know what tomorrow holds, but we know tomorrow, whatever tomorrow brings to us, we got somebody in here that's going to rescue us. He won't leave us here too long. He's going to take us home. He's not going to let the devil play with us. We don't have to be afraid. We know that there's a mighty God that's stronger than any devil on this earth. And he is a powerful God. And his love is unspeakable. He loves us so strong we couldn't say, we couldn't weigh it. We are unspeakable to this world, but to, oh, to Almighty God. He knows my name. He knows exactly where we are, wherever we are. He has an all-seeing eye that's watching us, and I praise him tonight because he has been here, and I have been thrilled with your worship and been thrilled with the presence that I've felt here. And I'm so thankful to have uh, heard that message this morning. It was, to me, it was so awesome. And of course, the singing, it's fantastic. I pray God's richest blessing on this church and to fill up these pews so strong that they've got to be standing around the corners and you've got to be saying, we've got to build, we've got to build, we've got to build. In the name of Jesus, so be it. God bless you all. I love you. Praise God. I did owe everything she said nice about you. And that was a whole lot. She doesn't brag everywhere she goes. Because we are honest people, you know. We try to be honest. Uh, and it's a wonderful thing. She told me this morning, the Frazier Park Campground in California was where we had our youth camps in our teenage years, and it's just a special place, still is. I can hardly go by there today without stopping, driving that five miles up there and just walking the grounds, talking to God, because God met me there as a 15-year-old, and he loves teenagers. He was a teenager. Don't you ever think nobody understands you? Jesus Christ was 13 and 14 and 15 and 16 and 17 and 18, 20. Yes, he was. So he can help you. In this uncertain time of pestilences, wars, and rumors of wars, we all need to keep our, weapon, our weapons ready to go and get all of them. They're all very important. What we think about our helmet and on covering the body. But we have a spiritual body that the weapons of God's warfare will cover. And one of the greatest ones is the shield of faith. All the other things are stationary. But that shield, wherever the enemy may be attacking, you can move it. <laughs> and it's important that you have your shield of faith working for you. Victory in this whole world and this walk with God will depend heavily on your faith in God. Don't ever give the devil an inch to make you think God doesn't love you and doesn't know where you're at. That is a lie from the pit. He loves you. Just pull that old childhood song out and sing it. Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible.
tells me so. When God says it, that settles it. And I believe it. You won't always feel love when you sing that song, but sing that baby anyway. And sometimes you'll just get enough strength for tomorrow. And other times you'll get enough for a month. But you've got to cast those devils out. But it's all done with your shield of faith. There's a scripture for us in the end time. If you can brand this on your experience. That great writer Jude in the New Testament. He said, building up your most holy faith. Praying in the Holy Ghost. That means you pray until that quickening comes on you and you go into the Spirit. And you don't just pray two or three sentences in tongues just to make sure, you know, just kind of touch and base. Oh, it's still there. Hallelujah. No, you learn to stay there for a while. Why? You're not just talking in a language you don't understand. You are building up your most holy faith. And you're opening yourself to the leading of the Spirit of God. And if we'll keep our most holy faith built up, we got that shield right here moving wherever it needs to go. And God will show himself strong for you. Praise God. I'm glad the Lord's he, 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 he put the weapons in our disposal. But we've got to put them on. We get to put them on. Hallelujah. I think we ought to give the Lord a shout of praise for this great presence of the Almighty we feel in this house tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Amen. The Apostle Paul said, above all, taking up the shield of faith. It's the most important part of your weaponry because you got to believe in God. Amen. Why don't we stand tonight? We have been abundantly blessed this morning. What an, it just felt like this morning's service kind of washed over in waves. And the power of the glory of the Lord just visited us in awesome ways. And I know many of you were blessed because you came back tonight for a second serving of the goodness of the Lord. How many of you are ready for something that God has in store tonight? Did you come with an expectation? Did you come believing God for something specific? I I just, uh, every time I come to the house of the Lord, I want to believe him for the supernatural. I want to believe him for something that only he can do that we can't conjure up ourselves. And that's what I believe God wants to do in our lives tonight. And without any further delay, I want to bring to this pulpit some precious people of God and people that I would love to think of as my friends and uh, just admire and look up to Brother and Sister Showstrand. Um, I've seen them from afar, but this week it's been a high honor to be able to actually spend some time with Brother Showstrand, and we have just had some very interesting and insightful conversations um, just in a personal level, and I thank him for kind of pouring into me as a younger minister. And Sister Showstrand, thank you so much for all of your ministry, for our ladies, and um, we're just appreciative of those that walk with God, and I thank the Lord for those witnesses tonight that are here with Brother and Sister Elms, uh, Brother and Sister Showstrand. You know what? You can live for God. That's not always going to be easy. There may be hills to climb. There may be some valleys to walk through, but you can live for God. And uh, Brother Showstrand was raised in the church, raised in a preacher's home, and he's still living for God today. There's a testimony for you right there. And without any further delay, I want to bring them tonight. Would you worship the Lord as they come to minister however the Lord leads them tonight? Go ahead and lift your voice. Lift your praise toward heaven right now. Thank you, Brother Carrington. You may be seated. It is indeed our honor and privilege. What a great family. What a great church. We were able to eat lunch with them and to see and to hear them singing and praying and these young folks. In this hour, you know, 
it is vital that on some level we recognize the importance of uh, spending time together with family and then also as sister elms just said the church the family of god and i know that requires a sense of vulnerability it requires a sense of openness and realness and honesty and so uh, here we are we're glad and i am uh, going to introduce you to the best preacher that i know Hallelujah. Go for it. Praise the Lord, everyone. You know he's just a little bit biased. <laughs> Only a little bit. Well, Brother Elms hit on something that we have been teaching our children for some time now, the armor of God. We're doing a mentorship program where we take the youth on the last Wednesday of every month downstairs where all the little kids are and then they conduct the lesson the service the activity da 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 because we're trying to train them to step into our shoes before we're too old to step out of them so so right now we're leading a group and so our children are very familiar with the armor of God because they've been hearing it for some time now but that's so that our young people are comfortable with the lesson so they could teach so we had a back to school rally on sunday morning and sunday night and this is a song that they are very familiar with and you may be familiar with it too but we'll just kind of warm up and those of you that weren't here sunday morning you can just look at me and stare and that's okay because i'm staring right back at you <laughs> i'm checking out the room that is a that is a high school teachers preemptive preparation for what might be happening. I usually start in the back row because people who are the most trouble sit the farthest away hoping they won't be noticed. Yes, yes. And then I just, then I just bow gate to the front and then I check out the sides because I'm already examining the room for where the trouble's coming from. From the fifth period football team Spanish class. That's exactly right. So I, I cut my teeth on high school Spanish and English and then went back and did ESL. And then I educated, I got myself educated out of a job because nobody wants somebody with a doctorate of education uh, teaching high school Spanish and English because they have to pay too much. So, so I had to hit the road and take my little keyboard and my little show on the road, which I did. And uh, I learned, and we're still gonna do this little Christian song. I feel like that I need to qualify what I'm about to do because my husband's like, what are you about to do? And, and uh, I've done many things, and the reason I did them, I was listening to Sister Garcia read my bio, and it just sounded so foreign. I was like, you know, nothing that she read made a lick of sense to the people who heard it. It's like, what? And they didn't, it didn't resonate. But I remember when we were pastoring in a little home missions church in Little Rock, Arkansas, when I was teaching high school and the uh, school principal came to my classroom while I was teaching. Miss Showstrand. You have got to get down to the office. Ray Charles is on the phone. I said, now look, y'all have played so many pranks on me. I know good and well, Ray Charles. Oh, it's not Ray Charles, it's his people. His people are on the phone. And uh, you got to come get this phone call. So I left my classroom and I was like, I'm fixing to get pranked really bad and so I went down there and sure enough it was a public relations firm for Mr. Charles and uh, they wanted to know if they could audition me to open for him well now wait 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 there's more behind door number three because the reason they even got my name is because when I moved to Lone Oak in 1977 and people found out I, I saw that people found out I did, I saw that. Look, I didn't have a nap. 
I did not have a nap. I'm going somewhere. I'm just meandering a little bit. Anyway, I, I've sang for the Girl Scouts, the Boy Scouts, the Eastern Star. Do y'all even know what the Eastern Star is? I think it's the female version of the... It's it, Masons. Yes. They figured that if I was good enough to sing at the Thanksgiving service in Lone Oak, population 4,128, I was good enough to sing for their Eastern Star meeting. So, yes, yes, that's how I begin my illustrious career. And so I, everybody and his brother and their dogs wanted me to sing because I sang for free and I didn't sound half bad, and I could play any piano they put up there, and they put up some things. I mean, I played, I shared with the ladies, I played a piano one time that had a mirror on it. So I, I really felt like I was in a saloon. It was a saloon piano. I know good and well that somebody, a cowboy, sat in a saloon and played that piano and had that mirror there so he could see what was coming and duck. Yeah, and I had to play that thing and make it sound good. I'm telling you the truth. I played all kinds of things, and so I got asked, uh, and then there were several. Um, I went to all kinds of missionary Baptist churches, African-American churches, where they did not necessarily believe like we believe, but they worshiped, and I worshiped like they worshiped. It didn't even matter because I was like, I am ripping with this. We're going to rip. And so we just all ripped together. So, I mean, I left sweat on every pew, on every piece of carpet. I, we screamed and shouted and danced and bucked. And so I got requested by this African-American group of people to sing for the man who was from Detroit, Michigan, who bought property in the country. Stay with me. This sounds like the Elms family tree right here. <laughs> I've been trying to figure it out for two days. To have a radio station, an all-American radio station, out in the country, and so I sang... They wanted me to sing something patriotic because they wanted everybody to come. And so I sang, we had the Pledge of Allegiance and the Boy Scouts were there and the Girl Scouts. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies. They never heard nothing like it in their lives. And I was doing it for free. That's even better. Forever waves of grain for purple mountains, majesty above the fruited plains, America, America, God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brother. From sea to shining sea. Oh, that was amazing. They loved it. And then after that, that man called his people to call me and say, would you work for us? Well, at that time, I didn't have a job, so I was a DJ for six months. <laughs> yes, yes, I was. I was Jan Showstrand FM 106 KWTD on your radio dial. Now, let's hear from Walter Hawkins. And who's our Christian of the week? And I got in trouble for that because there were churches who did not believe anybody could be a Christian if they were not apostolic and filled with the Holy Ghost. I got in trouble all the time. Brother Elms, I had to pray through. I had to use my shield. That shield was moving and grooving. Well, because I opened that radio station, that radio station went down, but that man had some powerful connections with the NAACP in Detroit. And when the NAACP wanted to come to Arkansas to do a benefit concert with Mr. Charles, Mr. Charles's publicity firm called My School, 
And Mr. Denton, my pr Mr. Showstrand, you gotta come. Hello. And there's the secretary. She's sitting right there listening. It's like being on a movie set of a series. I, yes, people were listening. People would, would stop. There was a copier in there. And, and when they knew that I was going to have a phone call, everything would stop. It's like, freeze frame. <laughs> so they can hear my end of the conversation. Uh, Mrs. Showstrand, we understand that you sing, and your name was recommended to us. Would you be willing to audition? Why, yes, of course, I'd be delighted. And we're pastoring this little, tiny, home missions church where they voted us in when we were absent. <laughs> oh, yes, Gomer Pyle's got nothing on me. <laughs> hey, and I hadn't had a nap. You're not recording this, are you? Turn it off. Immediately, I will deny it. <laughs> Too much caffeine and no sleep. And let me tell you something. So I was like, oh, yeah. You boys, you boys think you got me pegged. First of all, the instant they turned down Mabel Vell Pike and drove down the two lane out in the, wor out in the woods and pulled into that little tiny parking lot with that little white clapboard church, they had already sized me up. Made me want to walk in and do this. Play that funky music, white girl. I did. I wanted to do that, but I didn't. And he's like, where did you get that? High school teacher. High school teacher. It's like walking into Neiman Marcus with your skirt and your bun, you know, and your flip-flops, and they look at you and go, you ain't got no right to be here. But I sang a song that I wrote. Just remember behind every rain cloud is a rainbow. And a raindrop is something lovely with the shine shining through. So don't you worry when it seems to be dark and stormy. There's a silver lining somewhere hanging over you. Lift up your voice when you're again or smile it's true and when I sat there singing at that little upright and that man in his business suit and that woman that came with him these professional people they said well thank you very much for your time and I said well thank you for yours we'll be in touch okay so they walked out of the little clapboard church and the little tiny Pentecostal apostolic church with the little apostolic girl with the hair and the skirts. And they went away, and I got a phone call. We are pleased to offer you the opportunity to open for Mr. Charles at the Robinson Auditorium on Sunday night. I immediately went, honey, I'm going to have to miss church. That is not the will of God. And he said to me, you go, the Lord has opened the door, you go to that concert, you walk into that auditorium, first Steinway I had ever played in my life. I walked in with the prettiest black dress I had. I walked in with my best heels, and I had that hair all whopped up, don't you know? I did. I, I had my Pentecostal hair there, and I sat down at that wait a minute, before I sat down at that Steinway piano for that opening for Mr. Charles, somebody came up to me, the man who was my handler, and he said, there has been a request for someone to sing Mr. Charles's signature song, and he wants 50,000 more dollars to do it. I was like, what? Because I negotiated with them for 600. 
He wanted 50000 more. I was like, dear God, building fund. I need somebody to help me navigate these waters. You know, the, I, $600 was a lot for me to sing because that's just what I would have done for free. But, and I kind of chuckled and said, well, I'll do it for nothing. What is it? <clears throat> so this is what I wound up singing. Oh, beautiful. Oh, spacious skies. You know, when you're too stupid to know, I didn't know that was his signature song. I didn't lack a bit of confidence because I was too dumb to know that there were people of means and wealth and prominence and whatever. I just had felt like the Lord opened a door for me. And a former governor of the state of Arkansas was sitting in that audience. He has since deceased, and he wrote me a letter. That was one of the most beautiful things I've ever heard. And before I walked off that stage, I did my little part. Behind every rain cloud is a rainbow. And I testified just like we normally do, except I didn't bring the Lord into it. I just said, there's always hope. Never walk away. I went off stage. They clapped politely. And Mr. Charles came out. And Mr. Charles, I didn't know at that time, had a way of discerning people. He would take a lady's arm. He did that to me. And he figured out how big I was by feeling my arm. I found that out later. If I'd have known that's what he was doing, I'd have slapped his face. But I didn't. <clears throat> and my husband's like, oh, God, where is she going with this? I'm going all over the map. What I'm trying to tell you is this before I speak. God takes faith. And faithfulness. And then he uses what you bring to him that you have done over and over again. And when the time is right, because you're not afraid, I made a decision a long time ago when I was a young girl in high school and public school on the West Coast that I was going to be all in for him. So he trusted me when he opened the door that I wasn't going to seek that world, but that I would walk into it and I would stand there. And it made an impact because that night, a personal friend of Bill Clinton's was in the audience. And when it came time for him to have his third inauguration as governor, he said, I cannot ask people from Louisiana to come and sing. Who can I get to sing like that Pentecostal stuff? And she said, I know who you can get. And so she called me and said, well, I'd also done something called Hands Across America. And I did something also. I did a Veterans Day program where I was going to try to use denim and red fabric and Lonoke was so small and the streets were all parallel I was going to make the world's biggest American flag that could only be seen from an uh, airplane or a crop duster and we were going to do a, a veteran service oh I had big dreams I priced fabric well what I wound up doing was uh, construction paper in the gym <laughs> you don't need to laugh it ain't funny. But it made the paper, the Arkansas Democrat Gazette, and she saw it, and she said, that girl's a dreamer. I remember her from the Ray Charles concert, and she'd written me a note. I can't believe a white woman had the courage to do that. And I'm like, you ought to see me on Sunday night. <laughs> ah! Yeah. Well, after I sang for the Clintons, he started asking us to come to his gubernatorial rallies. And so my corral would get up, and they'd sing America the Beautiful. And Dale Bumpers, who was a politician of some note at that time, said, I feel like I'm in a camp meeting. And I thought, well, there you go. You just judged yourself right there because you know what a camp meeting is. I moved among the high and the mighty. And also the low. One of President Clinton's nemesis actually went to Lone Oak High School, and I was there the day CNN converged on our campus. It was so embarrassing because they wanted to know about this girl. I can tell you the night he was elected, 
in 1992 for the first time, our choir was singing there and I was directing Philander Smith College Choir, singing another song I'd written when I was 16 for an honors English class. Together we can climb any mountain. And I taught that to the senior class one year for their senior performance. And uh, I figured if it was good enough for them, it was good enough for a president-elect of the United States because we'd sung it all over Arkansas. And um, thus began my storied career, moving in and out of circles of influential people without ever being attached to that world. Now that I have your undivided attention. I am sitting in the room with people whose stories will exceed my own. But only if you are willing to risk yourself for your faith. Now, I had cousins. I would pray. I made a covenant with the Lord out of desperation that I would never miss a church service or school. I went to public school. But it wasn't because I was trying to get God to give me A's. I was a very good student, and I had a very high academic record. It was because I was so desperate for what I got in church that I didn't want to miss a service. Come on. Come on, come now, that's very different than coming to church because your mom and dad make you, because it's expected. You say, well, I don't feel that kind of drawing. Well, you need to get a hold of yourself, and you need to lay aside anything that would turn you away because the only way I have these testimonies is I have gone places with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords because he's been first, so he's taken me with him. Now, why I have these stories, I don't know. I got bunches of them. But my husband made reference to one, and I, I want you to just repeat after me so I can do the little song I promised you. I am a Christian. I am a Christian. You know it? A mighty, mighty Christian. Mighty, mighty Christian. I am a Christian. I am a Christian. A mighty, mighty Christian. I got the shield of faith, the of faith. righteous breastplate, righteous breastplate. Sword, of the spirit. sword of the spirit, my loins are covered by truth, covered by truth. Helmet, of salvation. helmet of salvation, I got my gospel shoes on. And above, all, and above all, I said above all, all altogether, I'm dressed in the whole armor of God. I am a Christian. All right, now give yourselves a hand. You got to be suited up. From head to foot, because the devil will take a shot at the way you think, the way you feel, what you believe when it comes to heavy lifting. If you don't have truth, then you're not going to be able to carry your own burdens because you're going to be hearing the message. This is too hard. And then not to be confrontational and fight with everybody because you're having struggles. That's the preparation of the gospel of peace. So... All of my experiences summed up are the stories of a soldier, a child that believed everything she was told from Sister Rosas, my first Sunday school teacher, who is a tiny little Mexicana. She was, she washed my feet during the watch night service and I would just cry and cry and I carry her with me in my heart. So you know, I'm, I'm taking her with me to Sister Seacrest, who sang, I've got a mansion just over the hilltop. I got all those songs in there and I can imitate all those people. <laughs> Didn't have television, I had to entertain myself. We danced like them, shouted like them, 
talked in tongues like them? We did. We had mass baptisms. We baptized everything. <laughs> Some of my best, most precious, and hilarious moments happened in church. And I wouldn't take anything for it. Now I am standing looking at young people who were the age I was when my heroes of the faith came behind the podium and told me their stories. I could tell you way more stories, like how I met His Holiness. The oh, I think he was called, no, he was more than right reverend. He was the Holy Archbishop of the Greek Orthodox Church at a prayer service. I sang at two inaugural prayer services. I sang the night of the election. I sang, and, oh, let me tell you this. You don't know Mick Jagger lips. You know what I'm talking about? I'm so not politically correct. I don't even care right now. I'm in Texas, in Amarillo with armadillas. Okay. His wife, Bianca Jagger. Bianca. His wife, that's all you need to know. Su esposa, eh? <laughs> so she is standing behind the barrier when we are singing, Together we can climb any mountain, written at 16. Okay? Resurrecting what the Lord gave me. It's not the thing. It's not the tool. He can make a rod turn into a snake. He can make a 17-year-old boy look like a menace or make him look like a joke until he lets that first rock fly. I'm telling you, uh, i got to tell you another one. Re when I look at you, Olivia, and I, and I go, Olivia, give me my cue. The cue is suit. Can you remember suit? Remember suit. Okay. So... Bianca Jagger is standing next to my father-in-law who couldn't get past the barrier. We were there. I had to go through all kinds of stuff to get on that property at the Arkansas State House the night of November the 4th when the Clintons were first elected. And Ted Koppel from, thank you, I thought that man was huge. He was little bitty. I was like, he's so little. He's so little. I thought he was so big. He's so little. Anyway, so I'm telling my crew, I'm saying, look, history will not record that we were here because we're nothing. We're a footnote. You listen to me right now. Your voices are going to go around the world, and somebody's going to hear the sound of redemption. We're going to pray that God will use this because the Egyptians are all up in their game at the top of the pyramid and they can't even see Israel. We don't even merit a too raw. But the God of heaven and earth put us here to mark a moment in history to show who he is. And we're going to approach it that way. And so we're going to sing with anointing, and you just follow me and do what we do at church, which they did because they didn't know what else to do. I mean, you know. And so this, she leans over to my father-in-law. She said, I feel something. I am feeling something. And I'm like, yes, you are feeling something. You are feeling the power of the Holy Ghost. And even though she may have forgotten it, it is written down the night that woman came in contact with La Verdad, the truth, the way, the life, the light. I'm looking at young people and asking, are you going to put your armor on and follow me into battle? Hoorah! Let me hear it. Hoorah! Thank you. Now you may be seated. So I sang that night. 
because I'd been singing all along, but I started with the Boy Scouts. What if I had been too proud to sing for the Boy Scouts or the Eastern Star or Little Miss Thing wasn't going to sing for the Girl Scouts or Little Miss Lala was too good or too shy to sing for the poor people on the other side of the street or I was too good to go across town and use my talent. I'm telling you, when the Lord asks you to do something, you just get up and do what he says. It's preparation for the next thing. Hoorah! Hoorah! You may be seated. So by the time I sang at the first one and the second one and the... I can't even remember where all I sang. I sang all over the place. And the, the president-elect would ask me to come. He wouldn't ask personally, but he would send people to ask me to come. And then he would direct what he wanted when he wanted it. And then he went to the White House, and they invited us to come. And there we are. And my little girls are getting up at 5 o'clock in the morning to go through the magnetron. And, and all these things, and all these people sitting in front of us on the side of us. And His Holiness, the Greek Orthodox Bishop. And I said something about, uh, this is an amazing event. I hope we feel the presence of the Lord. Or it's so nice to meet you now at this huge cross. I'm like, I'm, I'm going to work up a witness right here. I'm going to go fishing for this Greek patriarch. That's what he was, the holy patriarch of the holy whatever. Anyway, <laughs> there were several holies in there, and <laughs> your holiness. I mean, <laughs> you know, I think the Lord has a sense of humor because he just put someone like me right next to these very... <sighs> Magnificent people with their magnificent things. Do you know what I mean? <sighs> and I said, I hope the presence of the Lord is here. And I said, uh, it would be something to feel that. He said, yes. Do you think that this is all about the presence of God? Because he was telling me there's another power sitting in the room called politics. Oh, and people vying for position. And I was like, and I sang Alabaster Box that morning. First time I went. Stories. Well, fast forward, and then right before the second inauguration, no, yeah, I get a phone call. This time I'm at school. I am in class, and it's a secretary. Michelle Strand, you need to come down to the office right now. I kid you not. Her name was Shirley. <laughs> yes, this is Miss Shirley. You need to come down to the office right now. The president is on the phone. I said, oh, my Lord and my God. It's on Friday or Thursday, and they're fixing to have a funeral on Saturday, and he hadn't called. I get a phone call less than 24 hours. And so, just like before, I walk into that office, and everybody's kind of, you know what they're doing. They're just kind of trying to look busy, because nobody want to leave. Because some of them said, has the president asked you to sing for his mother's funeral? No, I hadn't heard a word. <laughs> You know, because I've done it 16 times, but it's a fluke. It's an accident. You know, they surely don't want to be a Pentecostal girl. So they all stand in there, and it gets very still, and I walk over. Hello. Hello, Janice. This is uh, Carolyn Huber. Would you hold for the President of the United States? She said, and by the way, I'd like to say this. I am so sorry. I had to, we were not going to tell them that it was him calling, but your secretary would not allow you to come to the phone. And finally I said, I am calling on behalf of the President of the United States. Would you please get Ms. Shostrand? That's exactly right. <laughs> That's when ignorance bows to power. <laughs> Every knee. See, I'm just getting a little taste of the way things really work. 
This feels very important. And all your hurt feelings and my hurt feelings and your background, all these things, the devil makes so huge. And what's happening in this, this magnificent, invisible story is happening behind us with all heaven and earth watching to see which one of us will walk past being offended and walk past holiness standards and walk past people's opinions and say, I will do whatever it takes because I fight with the Lord the captain of the army of the host of Israel. I can see it. I'm going to be it. Everybody say hoorah. Hoorah. You may be seated. How much time do I have? Uh, About five hours. Okay. I am so relieved. Next time you will let me have a nap. You most certainly will. Uh, I lose all consciousness of time when I have no rest between the first and second service. Okay, and so I answer the phone, and all them women that have places to go are going nowhere. They're like this. And I hear, Janice, yes, sir, Mr. President. You know my mother died. Yes, sir. Please accept our condolences. Janice, <clears throat> I want you to sing for the funeral. Now, I don't want anything sad. I want you to do that thing you do. I want you to work the crowd. Those are his words. I want you to work the crowd. Well, he's given me less than 24 hours to pull together a little old group of Pentecostal people not much older than y'all sitting right here, little altos, little tenors. And because his mother was a certain denomination, they put us on the floor and they put their choir up, you know, to make sure everybody understands status and where the power is. That was a mistake. You should never try to abase the people of God because all it's going to do is make you look like a fool when the power of the Holy Ghost falls and people are like my God in heaven and so we had to get up early once again nauseous times and my suit Olivia what's my word suit so I have one really pretty black suit it's the only one I got with some uh, little high heels And uh, it's got a wrinkle because the facing underneath the the wool is kind of, and I'm pressing and pressing, and I'm thinking, oh, my God. Lord, this is all I got. Well, I'm going to tell you what, Lord, you're going to have to blind them people. (laughs) I'm going to get up, and ain't nobody going to see that facing right there that's just kind of bubbly. You know what I'm saying? I know they're not going to see it. We walk through, and he said, I want you to play from the beginning. And so I said, Corral, the President of the United States has asked us to play songs, and I want you to do what we do at church, and we're just going to flow in the Holy Ghost, and so we're sitting in this enormous cavernous auditorium. My husband's looking at me. He's close to me. They give me a rotten piano, but I've had practice on rotten pianos all my life, so I know it's not going to be the piano anyway, because I know somebody else. The reason I am got up early and only had less than 24 hours and have a suit that's bubbled up and one little pair of black heels that look halfway decent and a bunch of kids who just graduated from high school and don't read music and don't know how to sing and they're just worshipers. I know why God has done all that with little Gideon's army because when the Holy Ghost begins to fall, nobody's going to say it was because they were awesome. What is it? It wasn't the keyboard and it wasn't the drums. It wasn't the bass and it wasn't because they were beautiful. I feel something like I never felt before. Everybody say hoorah. And so I sang, Jesus, Jesus, oh, Jesus. There's something about that name. Savior Jesus 
Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain. And we finished it, and then we sang. Jesus, no man cannot hinder me. Right on, King Jesus, right on. Go ahead and sing it with me. No man cannot hinder me. No man cannot hinder me. In that great Get not morning, fare thee well, fare thee well. In that great get not morning, fare thee well, fare thee well. When I get to heaven, gonna sat down and they be seated and that other church got up and they did their little high praise they were standing on the stage and we were on the floor and he said I have one song I want you to sing and probably three feet closer than Olivia is right now I looked down as I begin to sing. When I walked through the doors, I sensed his presence. And I knew this was a place where love abounds for this is a temple Jehovah God abides here and we are standing in his presence on holy ground in his presence I know there is joy beyond measure president of the United States first lady his brother and at his feet sweet peace of mind you're too loud. Shh. Can still be found. Quiet, not a sound. Dead silence. If you have a need, I know he has your answer. Read. 
reach out and claim it for you have made it to a holy ground you're my corral and i told him stand i feel the presence sing with you we They couldn't do what you just did. Completely quiet. In the dark. My legs were shaking. I was speaking in tongues while a little Jewish woman, five feet from me, never took her eyes off my face. And out of the depths of that cavernous auditorium, I heard these words. Oh, my God. They didn't know how to respond, but you do. One person who didn't know what to say said it for everyone who was dead in sin and trespasses. You may be seated. I got a phone call from the president of EMI Records. Hi, my name is, I used to remember his name. Barbara Streisand was in the audience the day you sang at the president's mother's funeral. She wants every single song you sang. Uh, Mr. So-and-so, I'm not sure what I sang. But I'll be happy to try to get you a list. He said, well, maybe I, I'll be able to come to Arkansas and we can break bread. Oh, that'd be wonderful. Never heard another word until a year later my phone rang. Sister Showstrand, Barbara Streisand's on television talking about you. Really? Well, what's she saying? She's got this new album called Higher Ground. And, and she said she heard you sing at the president's mother's funeral. And uh, she says this girl got up and sang, and I'd never heard anything like it. And I'm like, I'm 38. I goes to 40, and I got a wrinkle. Remember that? Right there. <laughs> this girl, and I'm like, how wonderful. And there was the CD, Higher Ground. Special thanks to Janice Shostrian, who sang this song. And she took out Jesus and put in Jehovah. 
you shall be witnesses unto me. In Judea, Samaria, Jerusalem, to the uttermost. Hoorah. And so you have an enemy. That was my introduction. Revelation, the 12th chapter and the 10th verse says, they overcame him. The red dragon of Revelation 12 is the serpent of Genesis 4. He's had time to perfect the art of lying and leading and seducing people, either through making you believe something that's not true that terrifies you, or making you believe something about this little group of people that brings you into shame or question. You see this hair? This is the same hair I wore when I was 14 years old and mama taught me, leave that alone. That identifies you as holy to the Lord. Leave it alone. I'm not condemning anybody. I'm just telling you that the things my mother taught me, hoorah, I have not let go of because I know that my adversary has left the garden and is the prince and power of the air. And the Bible said he's seeking to devour you and you and you and you and he doesn't care what you have to offer into intellectually or physically or mentally it's all a big game to keep you locked in your seat but when you make your mind up hoorah that you're marching with the captain of the army of the host it won't matter to you you'll be willing to risk your life for this thing because you know he is resurrection power Verse 11 said, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb, the red. Somewhere outside my hotel room, there are three flagpoles. There's one for the state of Texas. I think there must be one for Amarillo. I don't know. And then there's a third one that's the American flag. And all three of them were lowered to half mast. And I didn't have to ask because I knew why. Because some precious 20-year-old, and they weren't even older than 23, on a field of battle while they were escaping, gave their lives in service of this nation that may not respect or value them or their flag anymore but I believe in the red the white and the blue and I'm going to tell you what I'm not flying the American flag but I'm flying the blood of Calvary hallelujah that's my red and when that enemy comes after me after my head and after my heart I plead the blood of Jesus Christ I know the truth I've been washed in the red Hoorah! You may be seated. You like to hear my stories, but you don't know the battles I've been through to be able to tell them. You like the medals of victory, but you didn't see the sleepless nights. You like hearing about how great my life has been, but you didn't see me at 14 trying to get up the courage to dance in front of people who didn't dance to worship God, to not be ashamed of my hair, my skirt, my stand, my church. At some point, you're going to have to make your mind up that because he's the lion of the tribe of Judah, you can roar against what's roaring at you. Hoorah! Oh, lift your hands to the Lord right now. I am a recruiter. Who are you? When gloom and sadness whisper, you've sinned, no use to pray. 
I look away to Jesus and he tells me to say, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. I don't care how many times you mess up. Get up. Get up and get to the cross. Bow your knee and say, fix me again. Wash me again. The red, I'm in the, the blue and the white, you may be seated. The red blood of my life, Jesus said don't drink it. The life of the body is the blood. It's not your intelligence, it's not what your mother and dad gave you. My parents were saints in a church. My dad didn't teach me how to sing. My dad didn't teach me how to stand up in front of people and entertain. He didn't teach me any of that. I just did what he said do and God taught me. Walking in obedience to the common ordinary people that I lived with. You cannot despise your parents, your church, your upbringing and expect God can do anything with you. But when you harness down and say, God, you can use me right where I am. I'll do whatever you say. Now you are ready. Oh, lift your hands to the Lord right now. I want you to lift them again. I'm a recruiter. I want to know who I came for tonight. I've always wanted to march with the seals, see air and land. I made a choice. I want the guys that can do it everywhere. I've never carried an AK-47, but in my mind, I got boots up to my thighs. I got camouflage up to my neck. I'm a wild woman that can march into places nobody else wants to go because I believe the angel of the army of the host of God walked with me in high school when kids made fun of me. I believe they walked with me when I went into the Baptist churches and people sat down on me. I believe they walked with me when that Greek Orthodox patriarch smiled at that little pitiful girl and I got up and saying, you don't know the cost of the oil in my alabaster. I'm going to see him again. Hoorah! I know I look like a wimpy white woman, but I'm a warrior. I'm fighting what's going on in my head, and I'm fighting the voices in my heart, and I'm fighting the weakness of my flesh, because not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, thus saith the Lord of hosts. The hardest thing you'll ever do is get up tomorrow and go to work and go to school. Hoorah. You may be seated. The white, they overcame him. I've seen all kind of movies about kids overcoming demons and dragons, and I guess there's always been a little bit of the idealist, the little romantic girl, the one who didn't have a television, made up stories in her mind about conquering giants and, and setting peoples free. And I read a book that wasn't fantasy called The B-I-B-L-E, and it was taught to me about lions and people in dens. And it was taught to me about people that were fed by birds, and it was taught to me about people that uh, went through flames and didn't get burned. And I, I grew up, and if that's fantasy, then that's what I grew up on, and that people could walk past and say, in the name of Jesus. And I learned that you can't fast God into a miracle, and you can't pray him into a miracle. But the greatest miracle is when you just say yes to whatever he's asking you to do. It takes courage. Hoorah. Half you knew the things. My testimony. The white. He said, You overcome him by the blood of the Lamb, the word of your testimony. Well, you know what? 
if you got problems but you'll never admit them, then you, don't, you can't have a testimony because you're too embarrassed of peop for people to know what's happened to you. I'm not telling you to get up and tell your heart to everyone. Uh, when I was a kid, I, I couldn't even describe things that were going on with my head. And the Lord told me he just never let me say anything to anybody. I just worshiped wild because I was so desperate for God to do something with me. I was so hungry. I was like a little third grader who keeps raising her hand and saying, please pick me, pick me. I know the answer. I just need a little affirmation here. I just need a little encouragement. If you'll love me, I can learn anything you want me to learn. But if you don't love me, I can't even breathe. I can't even hold my eyes up because I'm too locked up in my emotions and you don't know what I've been through. And I'm thinking that everybody can look at me and tell you got problems. And so I, before I can be used for anything, I have to conquer shame. Doesn't matter to people who have it all together. Jesus said, except you become as a child. So he was my only source of relief. So I went to him like a dog looking for a kindness, a cur, a mongrel that has been turned out loose. And I just get close to him. And he would put his hand on my head and anoint it with oil. And I'd stay close to him, not because I was so holy, but because I was so desperate. Now all the other kids, they were doing their own thing and finding relief in other things. But I, had all, I didn't have enough sense to know there were other things. I just found one thing, and it was him. He cut me off from all the other things other kids have. I didn't have it, but I had Jesus. And while I was chasing him, he was reeling me in like a fish on a line. I thought I was chasing him, but he was chasing me. <laughs> he made you like you are. Put you in your family. Your argument is not with your mom and dad or your abuela or your puppy. Your argument is with God. And the question is, is God bigger than your affliction? Is God bigger than your drama? Is God bigger than your trauma? I'm telling you, the thing you're running from is your testimony. <laughs> Lift your hands right now. If you can't let God heal you, if you can't let God break through your reserve, if you can't say it doesn't matter to me, I surrender all. If all you want to do is show God your suit and your pretty teeth and your pretty hair, then you can't have a testimony because my God heals blind eyes. My God heals lame legs. My God raises the dead. My God teaches the dumb to speak. Stand to your feet right now. Some people need a testimony. Not from 40 years ago. You need one right now. No presidents are calling me now. I'm in uncharted territory. All that education, all that stuff jacked everybody up. I'm a homeschool teacher to a five-year-old, a six-year-old, and a 10-year-old. Where is the God of Elijah? Where is the God of presidential inaugurations? Where is the God of all that? Let me tell you my testimony. When I was nothing, he picked me up. He washed me. I don't care if the world values me, devalues me. I didn't come to this thing. I didn't get a mic in my hand because I politicked. I have a testimony. I am living, breathing, walking proof that God is greater than circumstance, that God is greater than affliction, that God is greater than what men perceive to be obstacles and inhibitions and prohibitions. Somebody raise your hands and scream, Hoorah! I'm 
I'm not 38 anymore, and Barbara Streisand is retired. I'm 62, and I'll be 63 next Thursday. I'm not dead, and I'm not done. But I've been living in the last days. And my battle is no less intense where I am at 63 than it was at 14. I am still battling the head game. I'm still battling the oops, I did it again. I still come to the altar and say, Jesus, forgive me. Honey, would you forgive me? Would you pray for me? I've done wrong. Will you help me? Will you bless me? Will you touch my life again? Anoint my head with oil. What are you doing? If you're not real, you can forget about blood and testimony. And and that means you're nothing but devil bait. You're nothing but a terrorist plot waiting to happen. Because if you don't march with this God, you're going to march against him. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Hoorah! You may be seated. I may never come back here again. I'm going to finish this. I'm going to finish this thing. 544, I'm going to finish this thing. The first day, I went to high school and took off the gym shorts and said, I'm not going to do this. I did it when we were indoors, but now I'm walking in front of 200 guys sitting on the ground. and Nobody's preached against it, but, but the reason I'm, I'm wearing them is I'm a coward because I'm scared they're going to make fun of me, and they made fun of me everywhere I've gone. I'm so tired of being made fun of. I don't want to be made fun of anymore. But you know what's battling with me right now? I keep seeing you hanging on the cross, Jesus, and I keep seeing Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and I know that I'm a coward. My mother didn't tell me to do it. My daddy didn't tell me to do it. But I got to know if I have what it takes. Hoorah. Or if I'm going to hide behind all those other girls, the surfer girls with their blonde locks and their bikini bodies. Uh, what am I going to Hoorah. Your revival. I fold them up and put them away. Mama, make me something else to wear. It was ugly. It was so ugly. I didn't think to tell her what to make. I just made me some. And I walked in that day, and I went to my gym teacher, and I had that ugly thing, that one-piece thing with the zipper up the back with the flap on the front in red plaid. <laughs> Mama had a remnant. I was trying to blend. <laughs> Forget about it. So they're either going to beat me to death because I was threatened in middle school. We're going to beat you and we're going to cut your hair off. And we moved to another school. And I had to have courage because I keep hearing these stories from all these stinking missionaries that come. You can't tell that to a child who believes what you say and then tell her, oh, no, that's not what I meant. Uh, so the day I brought that and I walked up to my gym teacher who was from an alternative lifestyle, but I didn't know it, and I do now. You understand me? I think you do. And I said, I, I uh, won't be wearing the gym shorts anymore because of my personal beliefs. I, have, I don't care what you wear as long as you dress out. Yes, ma'am. I went back to that locker room and sat on that bench. Well, this is the last day of my life because they are going to rip me to shreds. The little holy girl that they made fun of every day. Hoorah. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. I sat there just long enough to remind myself, I think my blood was pounding in my ears. I think all of heaven was standing in the locker room. I didn't feel any of them. Is she going to do it? Gabriel said to Michael. She's got the bag on her lap. She's folded her clothes up. She's pulling it out. Look. Look at her. She's got one leg in it. Another leg. She's zipping it up. It's ugly. Yes, it is. <laughs> Lord, we're going to have to blind those people because this is ugly. Hoorah. Shadrach. Meshach. 
put on my tennis shoes, and I walked out. And I held my head like this, and I looked straight ahead because some of the boys that were sitting on the ground were in my English class and my Spanish class and my biology class. And I just looked like this, like I'm marching to Auschwitz because I know they're going to kill me. When you're 14 and there's nobody there to advocate for you and you've been bullied, and I put it on and I went to the tennis courts and I played tennis. And I walked back. I could feel the shame all over me. That ugly Pentecostal girl. I walked back into the gym and took that off and put my clothes back on and folded it back up and wore it every day of high school till I got to basketball. And the beautiful surfer girl who was a cheerleader that everybody admired came over to me and sat down and quietly said, I like your outfit. I was like, oh, sweet God, if you had said anything but that. <laughs> but you know what she was really saying? Hoo-ah. I see something on you. You see red plaid, I see courage. You see red plaid, I see strength. You see red plaid, I see humility. I like what I see. Hoorah! Hoorah! We moved in my junior year to another school, and then we moved in my senior year. I met and married this man, told my testimony, and the Lord began to heal me. And then he began to open doors. Go sing for Ray Charles. Go sing for the governor. You can do it, but look at me. You go. God, open those doors. You go. People will talk. Let them talk. God is doing a thing. Hoorah. You go. Loose her and let her go. And Mary and Martha, let Lazarus go and set me free. Hoorah. And now my testimony resonates in the night when my enemy comes at me and says, you're an old woman and you have no strength and you're a has-been and you're a grandma. And I say, no weapon formed against me will prosper. I have a testimony. The red, the white, and the blue. And the blue is, we are living in a selfish hour. Please be seated. Me, 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 me. My, 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 my. I, 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 I. No sacrifice. No self-sacrifice. If it looks good on me and it makes me look good, filter the way I look, take off 10 pounds, put a filter on when you put me on social media because it's not the real me, but no one will know the difference because it's just a presence out there. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb, the dragon, the liar, breathing fire and threats against us, seducing and trying to pull you out of church by some pretty little thing or some smart little guy or some promise of riches and another life outside of Amarillo, man, woman, anything to make you let go of the red, the white, and the blue. The blue, and they loved not their lives to the death. They loved not their lives. Jesus said, you want to come after me? Hoorah. Sea, air, and land. I'm going to ask you to risk everything. What people think about you. 
whether they approve of you or not. For me, to risk what the public school is going to say about you, to take a stand. The word of your testimony, but also I want you to see your pastor's wife getting up at 6.30 in the morning on Sunday and getting here by 7. And go, I want to sleep in that extra 30 minutes, but she might need some help. You don't need to do that. You don't need to give extra. You don't need to give your time. Let someone else put the tables away. Let someone else bake the cookies. You're too young. You'll do it next week. Come on. Don't give a little extra. Don't go help your mama. Don't do the chores. You're smart. Find a way to skip out of it. And you know what? The same kids that cut corners when they were sitting in my Spanish class are still cutting them now as adults. They learned the art of not doing rather than saying, I really need to encourage you. It's going to cost me a little bit in time and energy. But I can't keep just living off the fat of the land. I've got to give something back. I've got to find every opportunity to do good that I can. How many things have I missed today? I had a chance to say something, to send something, to give something, and I missed it. Well, they don't need my, they don't need mine. How many people have talked themselves out of the blue? They don't need my five dollars. They don't need my five minutes. Oh my God. That's my defense against the red dragon. Hoorah. So we were barreling our way to Spain, down the coast of France. And it was midnight when we arrived in Monaco. Just a young man and his young bride left his parents in Brussels, Belgium. They were going to fly back to the States over the holidays that next day. We were going to go to Spain, España, my first time to go to España. I already have my degree in Espanol, but this man that I love, he's going to take me to España, and I'm going to dance in Barcelona. Barcelona. <laughs> I'm going to have to find me some sangria that ain't got no alcohol <laughs> because I am going to España where they live. And I cannot wait to get there. But before I get there, there's an Algerian and a British man sitting in the train station eyeing us. And they come up to my husband. Hey, you got any money? Midnight, no one's there. And I'm like, that's weird. I've never had anybody come up to me and say, hey, you got any money? I'm like, oh my God, Jesus, what are we going to do? It's not Texas. He is not armed. He can't pistol whip no one. So he takes out his coin purse, and he says, this is all I have. And I'm praying, and my heart's just starting to beat. I'm so tired. It's midnight. We have a midnight train to Barcelona. If we can just get there. We've come from Paris to Monaco, it's going to be all right. And the Lord just nudged that big old loudmouth American family right into that train station. Hey, come over here and sit down, everybody. And I'm like, oh, my God, American, uh, God bless America. And I said, can we just stay with you because I hear the sound of red, white, and blue. And I'm feeling threatened, and I need some help. Stay with us. We get on the train, and we have, we don't even have a couchette, which is just a French word for a sleeper. We have a bench here and a bench here, and he and I are sitting on this one, and there's a foreign man sitting across from us. He never opens his mouth. I tell my husband, I'm so sleepy. I'm just going to tuck my purse underneath my seat and close my eyes. About 3 o'clock in the morning, I needed to blow my nose. And I reached under and said, oh, Lord, where is it? And I reached a little further. Nothing. 
passport, my little cross pin that I got for my graduation, my Kleenex, our American Express traveler's checks, gone, all of it. I start crying. I'm scared. It's the middle of the night. I'm in a train to nowhere. We stop at the border, and my husband gets out, and he begins to talk to the train officials because they're asking, would you have a ticket? Do you have a ticket? No, I do not have a ticket. I have him robbed. Siva, <laughs> Siva, <laughs> I make you think, Siva. Help, somebody help. We cannot uh, let you go further. You do not have the ticket. I know I do not have a ticket. I have him robbed. <laughs> me ha robado, me ha robado. Do you understand, you ignoramus? You're at the border. Me ha robado. Robado. <laughs> no, they didn't understand. Uh, 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 I, I need to make a phone call. You understand phone call? No, you don't understand phone call. I'm about to lose my mind. <laughs> then my husband opens his wallet and immediate comprehension. I said, I'm going to tell you what. I'm an American. I could kill you right now. <laughs> with my bare hands. I could rip your face off with my teeth. <laughs> Hoorah. <laughs> Two days. I cried for two solid days. He didn't know what to do with me because I already had in my head since we were going to, we had been robbed, we were also going to be murdered. And this, yes, it's very logical to go from one to the next. <laughs> I'd been robbed, they were going to kill us. Number three, my mother will never find my body. Where is Jesus? And I, I was so haggard looking. I was so haggard. And when he finally got us a hotel, and he's trying to get me bread to eat, he's trying to feed me, he's trying to nourish me, he's trying to nurture me. He's really, tr if he had some duct tape, he would have used it because <laughs> I'm falling apart. I'm just pieces all in that room. I've been robbed. I've been hurt. I've been wounded. Somebody's after me. And he, w he made a phone call to his mom and daddy. He was able, over bon ani, it is bon ani. I don't give a rip if it's bona whatever. I'm telling you, I need to make a phone call. Do you understand phone call? We didn't have cell phones then. And so he went to a pay phone and he got a hold of the hotel and he said, Mom and Dad, we've been robbed. Well, Keith, what, he, what, son, get on the plane, Mom and Dad. Get on the plane and leave us here. Oh, I can't. Oh, my God. I'm safe. They're not. I've got to walk away. Oh, Jesus. Leave the children with me. Oh, God. And they did. They got on a plane. And before they left, they went to the proprietor. Look, our children are coming. They're coming. Here's some extra money when they get here. And from the moment they got the phone call, they began to call the embassy. Let me tell you what an embassy is. An embassy is a sacred place for citizens of another country who can't get home. If you can get to the embassy, your citizenship is recognized. It is guarded, it is considered home soil. If you can get to it, they can save you. If you can get to the embassy. We took an all night train after waiting for two days in a horrible little hotel on the border, Serber. I will never forget it. I hope I never go again. I have had to pray through over the French ever since. <laughs> of hatred. Yes. Yes. And when I found out they wouldn't let us fly over when we were bombing the <clears throat> out of other people, I was like, oh, no. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. I will not drop a single sink. Not a p 
henny, na, na, na. I will not buy, I will not, nothing. No more French fries, American fries. <laughs> Hoorah. Sea, air, and land. Now I know you're God of the mountain, but are you God of the foreign soil? Are you God when I'm robbed? Got on that train, an all-night train to Paris. One of us slept and one of us watched. We're learning quickly. Watch and pray. All night long, I'm dragging my luggage into the city of Paris down the Champs-Elysees where the rich of the rich are doing their business in the houses of couture and fashion. And I look like I have been rolled in mud in a pigsty. I've been awake for 48 hours. I look ugly. I sound ugly. I'm acting ugly. And a man in a large Mercedes Benz pulls up at the intersection and he has his window down. I'm pulling my luggage and my little London fog coat and he looks at me like this. And I stopped in the middle of the street. And I turned around in perfect English and said, what are you looking at? <laughs> and felt much better. <laughs> I did. They said, you cannot leave this country, madame. You cannot get on a plane unless you have papers from your country. But if we can get you to your country, they will give you the passport and you can go home with the right papers. And we drug our weary selves to a gate where there stood a flag, red, white, and blue. I think he must have been seven feet tall. In his dress uniform, standing to attention. Sir, I'm an American citizen. I have been robbed. I want to go home. Ma'am, right this way. This Marine ushered me into home in a foreign land, opened a great big old door. I walked into carpet so thick, I sank up to my ankles. And I got to the desk and I said, I'm Janice Showstrand. We have been waiting for you. Your parents have been calling every hour on the hour, checking in at the embassy. Are they home yet? Are they home yet? Do you know what this little building is? It doesn't look like much over here on this boulevard in comparison to that great big enormity you had. But I'm going to tell you what this is. It is a portal. It's a portal and the red, white, and blue flies here. Hoorah! And the people in here have been watching in the blood of the lamb and they're wearing the red the white and the blue I want you to march with me there's a terrorist battle going on but if you can find the lost the weary and the broken you're a soldier of the cross and your job is to bring everything that breathes into the safety of this house Hoorah! would you stand to your feet and lift your hands Put your hands down. Close your eyes and bow your heads. Right now, Louisiana is being inundated. Somebody's going to get a P row as soon as the wind dies down. And they're going to take their little boat and they're going to start looking. For survivors, Alamoshayaka. I'm 
I'm recruiting. I was 14 when I got up at Brother Elms' service and preached my first sermon. And he figuratively put his arm around my shoulder and said, this child has preached every point of my sermon, including the altar call. I'll never forget his words. I was recruited that night. I don't want to know what you can't do. I just want to know if you're ready to enlist for the fight of your life. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Lay your pride down. Glory, glory, hallelujah. It's going to take courage. I'd like to call you by name, but I can't. If you'll march with me, a dreamer with gray in her hair, I want you to come to the front. Is anybody going to march with me? Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is pressing out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the fatal lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. I see red.
young people on either side, the young men and the young women. The Lord's calling you. He's calling Hallelujah. I'd like some brethren to pray for these young men here. We need some dads and some fathers to pray for the young men that are in the altar right now. Young men, you're going to have to live pure lives and give yourself to the Lord holy. I only know the name of Drake and Creighton, but I'm calling on you. I'm calling you out. To run to your calling. I'm calling on Hannah and Rama and Sharon and Natalie and Lana and Olivia. I'm calling Miriam and Anthony. You're first. Be an example. Your shoes on your feet. 